Good morning. Let's stand. We're going to worship the Lord this morning. We're going to get ecstatic about it. What do you think about that? That's a big word. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house. Praise the Lord. Glory, hallelujah. The sun is shining, and Jesus is alive and well. Amen. And uh, praise God. It looks like it could be going home time. That'd be all right, huh? Amen. Think so? Hallelujah. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Yes. But we better take it easy here. <laughs> okay. You're just giving me sermon material. You know what? I want to thank you all for all the happy birthdays that was on Facebook for me and uh, all of them that I that you gave me all week long and the gifts that you gave and my goodness, this is amazing. God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Oh, well, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Lord, as we come into your house, we come in with with one one objective, one, one thing is to please you and to walk in your goodness and God to be able to, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And God, we thank you today in the name of Jesus Christ. God, would you heal that which is sick, that which is lame, God, cause them to walk, that which is mute today, God, just fill their heart and loosen their tongue, open their eyes, and God, to you be the glory and praise today. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and our Savior, amen. 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 Yeah. 
Yeah. 
song how he loves I love this song because it tells me who's in control you know maybe you came in here with a burden maybe you came with some with some bondages well I know where the spirit of the Lord is there's freedom 
I believe that he wants you to be free in this moment right now. And he's just asking you to come to him. You know, there's something about praise and worship that gets our mind off of the past. It gets our mind off of what we're going through. Because, you know, Nassan says, I don't have time to maintain these regrets because I'm wrapped up in how he loves me. (laughs) He loves you. That's the simple message of the gospel, of a God who came down to earth just to be with you. Because he's seen the struggle you're going through. He's seen how you're you're being beat down every day. And he wants to just hold you and hug you and tell you, I'm here for you. And so I just want to pray for you that today you just meet him in a powerful way. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. There's nothing more to it. So Father God, I just thank you. Oh, goodness and mercy follows those you love. And so, Lord, I just pray right now in this sanctuary, in this place, that, Lord, you would just move. Just move in people's hearts and minds, that you would open up, open up your love to them. And your love isn't far, actually, it's right in front of them. They just have to walk through the door and accept it. But it's not a door that you have to open, but it's an automatic sliding door to the presence of God. You just start stepping forward, and he's there. You don't have to wait for someone to open the door. He's there. So, Jesus, I pray that you would just speak to people today. I pray that you would surround them with your presence. I pray that you would wrap your arms around them and say, Welcome home, my boy. I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad you're here. So, Jesus, would you just uh, speak to people? Would you open their minds, open their hearts? Would their hearts not be hard today? In this place, would you open the hardness of the heart, God? And, Lord, I pray that you would speak to them and tell them how much you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, so glad you're at church this morning. Who's happy they're here? Yeah, yeah there we go. All right, well, you know the drill. Shake some hands. Mingle.
Well, good morning. Grab a seat. We're going to get started. We welcome you to Cornerstone. We pray you had a wonderful Thanksgiving with your family. So, yeah, well, it is good to have you here. Like Nick said, it's a great place. Are you happy you're here? Wow. Oh, amen. Well, um, last week we had a great week. I trust that uh, our church, um, so many people in this church just have a heart to bless others and to give. And so because of your generosity, we were able to go to the Mission Bible Training Center on Tuesday. And uh, we had ordered food from the uh, food bank up in Houghton. And then we bought a bunch of food that they had also. And so we spent around $1,000 and bought 6,000 pounds of food. Amen. Yeah, wow. <laughs> we had so much food ordered that Jerry, who's the director up there, called me and said, you better bring more than one van. And uh, I said, oh, I know how to pack. He said, no, you better bring more than, you know. So we had gotten so much stuff that we had to take two of our vans up there. And so we had, uh, yeah, so it was good. We had four guys that went up there and just uh, enjoyed the day and blessed them. And then uh, Carolyn was there and Brendan and Rachel last night, and Carolyn was ministering there. And uh, so we have a picture of Carolyn this last week. There's Carolyn and Brendan. There, yeah. So... Carolyn messaged me, 36 months, wow, free, and Brendan, 25, and so we are so blessed that, wow, I mean, uh, she messaged, uh, Carolyn messaged me, I think it was Thanksgiving morning, and told me that, and I was just overjoyed with the goodness of God and his incredible faithfulness to us. What a wonderful thing, huh? I was uh, at the uh, mission on Tuesday, and... Uh, um, it's nice um, because when you take people with you that really know how to work, you don't have to. And so, <laughs> so I did nothing. <laughs> I, when they were loading the van, I was just talking. And when they were unloading it, I was talking. And so um, when we were unloading it, we, got, we were able to meet some, uh, a pastor and some people from down by Green Bay. And they'd heard about the mission, and they were up there that day. And uh, just overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that was being blessed. But what it was so good to be there is to see lives that have been transformed and lives that have been changed. Um, I met one man there that um, he's there. Th he's been there three years, and now he's part of their leadership with directing it. And uh, so I get I did I've never met this man before. And George said, "You gotta you gotta hear this guy's story." And so he came over, and he was uh, there with another pa the other pastor. And this so we were both standing there, and this man said. He said, when I, w I came here, he said, the doctor had given me three to four months to live. And he was um, really obese, and he was in congestive heart failure. And he was on all this medication. And he said, within four months of being there, he said he quit taking all of his medication. He said he's never been back to the doctor. And he's down, he's lost like 180 pounds. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was like, wow. And I was like, no way, no way. Is that amazing or what? And he said, I've never been back to the doctor. You know, I just said, wow. And he's now, and, and what George told me, because George has been there for a long time, and he, he, George said this, isn't it something that when you become a captive to Christ, you want to serve your life? You want to give your life? And that's what he said. George said, I'm a lifer here. I thought, what a, what a great thing. And so I told him about what a joy it is for our church to be a part of that. And he said to our church, he said, the food that you guys bring, he said, that will give us, push us through the winter. And, uh, and it's a place that they don't require anyone to pay anything to come there. If people have a need, they come and they minister to. And we have a young lady there named Allie that I got to see. And she came in and I said, Allie. And she was surprised to see us and gave her a hug. Oh, it was just a... Uh, the goodness of God, isn't it? To see lives that are transformed by the power of Christ. It never, it never ceases to amaze me how Jesus said, I can take those that are lost and I'll find them. 
and I'll find and I'll give them a reason, a purpose for living. And uh, just what a great thing that is. Amen. Um, Nick's going to come and, and uh, give some announcements and then take the offering. Um, so Nick's interning with us this year. And um, I was so, uh, somebody texted me this morning, isn't that a great day to, you know, to go to church and worship the Lord? And I said, it is. I don't even have to plow snow today. <laughs> so the last two weeks, we've had to plow snow. And last week, I showed up here, and uh, it was about 530, and I started to plow out here in front. And there was just, you know, the, the bank that was out there. And uh, then I see a blue PT Cruiser coming down the road. And about quarter to six, Nick shows up here, and he starts shoveling the walks and snow blowing. I tell you what, that is important. We think ministry is about, it's about serving. That's about every one of us, serving. You don't care what it, that means or where you go. You just find a place to help someone in need, and you do it. And I'll tell you what, um, I was so grateful that I even gave him a hat. He came without a hat, and his ears were just just beat red. <laughs> it's amazing what snow blowing will do when it's like 10 degrees out. Um, so I was so blessed. I thought, wow, what a good thing Nick's out there. So come on, Nick. Bless us, all right? Yeah. Oh, if I was out there 10 more minutes, I look like Rudolph. Oh, so we just got some announcements for you. So glad you're here this morning. If you join on live stream, we welcome you. And uh, we just want to let you know we have the, uh, the next three months of daily bread. So if you want daily bread, they're in the back. The ushers will give them out. Uh, if you want them, they're on that back table. And uh, yeah, this is definitely important. You need daily bread. Everybody needs bread. Bread, uh, bread keeps us from going hungry, essentially. And so it's good. It's good bread. It's better than the bread I make at the uh, Bread of Life. <laughs> oh. oh, so uh, December 18th uh, is a family Christmas Sunday, and after our uh, service, we are going to have a potluck. And so if, uh, uh, I think, I believe uh, Robin put A to K, you know, for last name, uh, bring a main dish, and uh, L to Z, salad or dessert, would you just come and join us? We just want to have fun with you and have fellowship. It's going to be a good time. It's always good to get around people and talk and just have some fun, isn't it? Who doesn't like fun? So, yeah, be sure to be there for that. Bring a, bring a little food. And uh, we also uh, need help for uh, ringing the bell for the uh, Salvation Army over at Walgreens. And the sign-up sheet is on the back. Uh, so if you would like to do that, we uh, sure encourage you to come and help us with that. We have a lot of slots. I think there's about eight or ten slots to fill. So don't be shy is what I know. And uh, oh, also, uh, this coming Wednesday, we are going to decorate the sanctuary for uh, Christmas. So if you would come around 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning, if you want to come and help us, we would so appreciate it. Because we want to make this place just look just beautiful. Uh, for uh, Christmas and the seasons to come. and So yeah, if you want to help us with that, uh, the guys from the Bible study afterward will help bring up the decorations. We just would love to have like, people uh, come along with us and help set that up. And uh, Yeah, I believe that's all the announcements though. And uh, if we would have the guys come for the offering. Oh, what a good morning. You know, I was uh, thinking about this and uh, you know, the Lord's so good to us. He has really been faithful, and it's always good to be faithful back because you can never outgive God. And actually, I heard one guy put it as God can use more of that 10% or 20% or whatever you give than you can spend on yourself. And that's so true because, uh, man, God can just do wonders. And, you know, I just believe it's a good thing. So, Tom, would you pray for this offer? that we don't even know of in other countries, Lord. And I just ask
and see if they multiply them and close the door and make good junior work or college work. Amen. Amen. It's time to strike up the band for this week's On the Road. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman. He was only in third grade, but Henry Boyer already knew what he wanted to be. As we first reported a few years ago, Henry discovered his passion after attending a University of Michigan football game. They were that good? My mind was blown of how good they played. But it wasn't the football that he fell for. It was the marching band. He even wrote a letter to the band saying how he'd love to sign up someday. Let's go blue! And in response, the band sent him a bunch of swag and a card, inviting him to audition when he's older. What were you because that's the des description that we want is that we've been faithful at the end of all these things that we've been counted as those that have been faithful those that have took some risk those that have stayed the course and this morning I want to talk about this uh, this word that Jesus describes as the faithful when he says in this parable he says well done well done, you've been faithful in these places. Last week we talked about, uh, Josh talked about how um, the character of faith and what are some dynamics or what are the characteristics of, of those who have been called and he used uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews and he talked about some characteristics of, of people that have stayed steadfast and remained true to their calling. That's what really faithful means is to remain true or ste uh, steadfast to what you began. And you finish the race. Like that's what Paul said is he wanted to what? He wanted to finish the race that was marked out before him. When we finish the race, we experience the presence of God because he says, I'm going to be there in that place. It says, 
well done. At the end of this, all oh, this thing, Jesus talks about this, and he talks about a parable. And hear me, a parable is something that's so vitally important because really it's about a life lesson. Jesus used parables to teach life lessons, to teach lessons about the kingdom. In chapter 25, what he talks about is he begins chapter 25 and he talks about 10 virgins and he talks about five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. In this whole discourse, Jesus is headed toward Jerusalem and it's just before Passover and he knows what's coming at Passover. He is going to be the sacrificial lamb. They're not going to go out into the pasture and get a lamb. He knows that he is the sacrificial lamb. And so he begins this discourse and he begins to lay down things that are so vital that you can't miss them. Lessons that he wants us to understand and learn because he goes back to again and again as he said, this is what you're going to experience when the end of the age comes. And he said, these are some of the characteristics that you're going to walk through. And so when you're aware of them, when you're alert to things, what you can do is you can prepare, right? You can prepare for what's coming. Now we have the ability to prepare for storms, don't we? We have the ability now. Can you imagine what it was like years ago when they had no idea that a storm was coming? They had no ability to prepare for what was coming. But now because we have so much technology that people can get prepared, right? And isn't it something how people get prepared for snowstorms? Remember the snowstorm that hit Buffalo last weekend? And they had to move the football game. Can you imagine 80 years ago, 100 years ago when they had no ability, even less than that, to prepare because they knew that they were going to get not inches of snow, but feet of snow. And so what happened is the highway department was prepared, right? All those companies that move snow were prepared. All their equipment was fueled up. Everything was ready to go. Their guys were all ready to go. Because why? Because they knew that a storm was coming. And so they prepared. You see, at the end of the age, it's referred to as a storm, but you and I can be prepared, and that's why we can be those that are the faithful, because we've prepared for what's coming, what's going to arrive. And so it doesn't have to catch you or I off guard, because when things catch us off guard, what happens is we panic, don't we? We respond in a place of panic because we're caught off guard by something that we weren't planning for. I was with my cousin this last week, and uh, on Thursday, he, um, I said, I'd like to come and see you. I stopped there to see him five years ago this last Thanksgiving, on Thanksgiving morning, and he said, this is where it all began. And his wife came to faith in Christ in their farmhouse living room that morning. And what happened from that is now her son has come to Christ. Her, his da her daughter-in-law has come to Christ. And now he has come to Christ. He said, I'd like to talk to you. And so we were just sitting there and we were just talking. I've invited him to come to Cornerstone because his testimony, he is three months younger than I am. And his testimony is one he's lived as an angry man all these years. But now to see his life transformed. He said, I know it's a long way to come. But he said, I've been talking with our pastor. And he says, they go to Crossview Church there in Wisconsin Rapids. And he said, I'd like you to come down and be a part of my baptism. I said, oh man, what a wonderful thing. We were talking about just the goodness of God. It caused me to think back almost 30 years ago. We were at a family reunion and his niece started to choke and she was about, she was a little over um, one and a half on this hot dog and she started to choke. It was something that I was not ready for because what happened when, I, when, when emergencies come that I'm not planned for and not prepared, what I do is I panic. See, if you have a medical emergency, the last person you want around you is me, okay? So don't be thinking, I'm going to be some paramedic, because I'm not. I'm going to my prayer closet. So I'm going to pray the Lord send somebody else to help you. And I saw this girl sitting at a picnic table, this little girl, and she was the same age as my daughter, and she started choking on this hot dog, and I just don't know where I was going, but I was going somewhere. And I was leaving. Good thing my brother-in-law, who is a paramedic, was there, and he knew what to do, and he saved that girl's life that day. We were at Thanksgiving, and he was talking about that, and I was thinking about how when people panic, how they respond, and they react in irrational ways. Because I was headed somewhere across that park, 
And I didn't have a clue where I was going, but I knew I, I couldn't. You see, when you don't get prepared for what's coming, you can react in panic. But when you're prepared for what's coming, you can respond as one of faith. And you can react. You see, my reaction, Emerson Egrich said this a long time ago, and I think it's so accurate because it's constantly in the back of my mind. My response is my responsibility. How you and I respond is our responsibility. And so what Jesus is telling us is, how are you going to respond when you see all these things happening? Are you going to be one that's filled with fear? Because in the story he tells, in this life lesson he tells, he talks about two individuals that are filled with faith, and then he talks about one individual that's filled with fear. And so he says, these things are going to happen. These things are going to come. And so he says, you have to predetermine You have to predetermine how you are going to react, how you are going to respond to adversity or difficulties. And because of the way you respond, you will either be called one that is faithful or one that is fearful. And so he lays down this whole analogy of the kingdom. And so he talks about these five virgins that were wise because they were prepared. And then he talks about the five that were unwise because they were not prepared. I believe that today you and I are called to be those that are the wise. That those that are looking at the signs of the time and we're not being hopeless, but we're saying, God, we thank you that you said that these things are going to happen. But you know what? Also, you said that you're going to pour out your spirit in these last days. How many believe that? Oh, I believe that. I believe that God's going to begin to awaken people and alert people to what's happening and they're going to begin to look for hope. And that's what I see with young people is they're saying all these things that we've been taught or all these things that we believe are not accurate, they're not true. And they're leaving us in a place of despondency or desperation or despair and, they're call, and God's calling them out of that and all of a sudden they're realizing I want to be wise. I want to know what God's speaking. Do you know that right now there is such a desire to know the word of God? And it's being awakened in young people. Isn't that amazing? That young people are being awakened to the word of God. That there are people that don't even proclaim Christ, but yet realize that this is the word, this is the truth. And if you would apply it to your life, you'll experience the promises that are declared for you and I there. And so we want to be wise. The parable that we're going to read today is, like I said, the faithful or the unfaithful. So we're going to start reading in chapter 25 and verse 14. For it will be, now he's talking about the kingdom and the principles in the kingdom and and leading us into this place of what's going to happen. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and he entrusted them his property. And to one he gave five talents and to another he gave two and to another he gave one, each according to his own ability. And then he went away. He who received the five talents went at once and he traded with them and he made more, five more talents. And so also he, in verse 17, it says, he who had two talents made two more talents. But he who had received just one talent went and dug a hole in the ground and he hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and he settled accounts with them. Don't miss that. And, and he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you have delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he who had two talents came forward and said, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two more. And the master said the same thing to him previously in verse 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of the Lord or your master. Don't miss that. He who also had received one talent came forward and saying, Master, I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you had not sown, gathering where you had not sca- where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and I hid your talent in the ground here you have, here, have what is yours. But his master answered him and said, you are a wicked and slothful servant. You knew I reaped where I had not sown and gathered where I had scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with bankers at my coming. I should have received what was my own with interest. Verse 28, 
So take this talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will be more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he will cast that worthless servant into the utter darkness in a place that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You think about this portion of scripture. It's not for the faint of heart. It's for the faithful. It's for those that will count the cost. Those who understand that what is right now in front of us is opportunity. Those that will look forward with an expectation and a hope and say, these are the best times. These are the times that God's appointed us to live, and we need to be those witnesses that will take and be faithful. So here's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. Isn't it something that he says that this master was going away on a long journey, and so what did he do? He took what was his, and he entrusted it. He entrusted it. A better word here for servants is a bond servant. Someone that willingly puts themselves under another person's authority. Do you understand that? So these servants are really bond servants that they're not in the slavery type of a mentality or what we think of, but it's actually that they have chosen, they've willingly put themselves under another's authority. And see, that's what Jesus is talking this parable about you and I, because what happens is when we willingly say, you are Lord, isn't that what we call Jesus Lord? It means master, where we have taken, and it's not been something that we have been forced upon, manipulated into, but we've put ourselves in him or in his service willingly. And so it says he invites us then to partner with him, to partner with him. Isn't partnership a great responsibility? It's a great opportunity, isn't it, that you would partner And what he says is talents. Now, in that time, talents were referred to as this. It was just a measure of something that was valuable. When Jesus teaches this this parable of the talents, he says, I'm trusting you with something. I want you to partner with me with something that's very valuable, and it's measured out. And so he invites them to come. It's not that he's forcing them, but he says, I have this for you. And I invite you into this opportunity to partner with me. And then you begin to recognize, man, there's potential here. Opportunities can equal potential, can't they? I remember a friend of mine about seven, eight years ago told me something at holiday one morning. He said, have you ever heard of Bitcoins? And I said, never heard of anything like that. He said, well, I'm going to put $1,000 into Bitcoins. I said, really, that seems like an awful lot. Oh, you wonder why he's driving around a brand new Dodge? Because he took $1,000. It was an opportunity, right? An opportunity seven years ago on a Bitcoin you could buy for $20. Now, I don't fully understand cryptocurrency and anything like that. And so don't come to me like I'm an Edward Jones guy. I don't even know Edward Jones understands that. But what he was saying is he said, I think there's some opportunity here, Todd. And I said, oh, I don't know about that. See, I don't understand it. And somehow I think that because I don't understand it, it doesn't work. Hear me. Just because I don't understand it. We don't understand a lot of these things here. But if we would step into them, we would experience the the potential of the opportunity, right? See, if I would have taken that guy's advice and said, oh, yeah, maybe I could get $1,000 and put it in there with you, I would have realized, man, there's some opportunity here that I would never have understood before. But it's the potential to step into it and to risk it. And so what he invites these three is to come alongside him into these opportunities that he has placed before you. Hear me. That every one of us have been given opportunities that are in front of us. Every day, every week, there are opportunities. And I'm not talking about financial gain. I'm talking about opportunities to be a light to people. Opportunities to be a hope to people. But what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do the same thing that these first two did is they took a risk because there is no reward because later on Jesus says there's a reward for them, right? But there is no reward without entering into the risk. That means risk at times this week of being vulnerable. Maybe it is financial, risking something that says, no, I believe that God's called me to do that. I believe that God's called me to pour into that and to sow into that. 
Because he's given us. Because there's going to be an account that's giving. It says there's an expectation that's coming. An expectation of what's given. So we see that. Where he is going to come and he's going to give an account. He's going to come and take an account. Now he's going to take an account on not the amount, but their ability. Do you see that? See, Jesus teaches this parable, and in our world right now, where we want equity in everything, he says that he created us all equal, created us in his image, but our abilities different, don't they? You and I somehow, we have different abilities. We have different abilities that are God-given abilities, right? Last year, when we were trying to fix this, uh, the keystone up, and we bought this power vent because we eliminated the chimney. We tore the chimney out and, and we ordered this thing and it came and I can tell you what, it was a power vent that was hooked up to the thermostat and it had all these wires in it. You know what, that power vent would be still sitting in a box if it were not for Jim Bale. Because Jim Bale has the ability in his mind to be able to comprehend that stuff and figure it out and run all these wires. And so I go down there and he's trying to explain to me where wire's going. And I'm just like, it turned on. Thank God. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. It turned on. That's all I want. I plowed snow by there and I see that little vent and it's blowing some little smoke out of there. Praise God. I don't need to know anymore because I can't know anymore. Because my abilities are limited in those areas. It's not that he's better or worse. Well, some people say that differently. But he uh, understands his abilities are given for a certain purpose, right? Isn't that right? So it's not about us being... It wouldn't be terrible if every one of us had the same ability or the same... Uh, it would be terrible to live in that. So each one of us have been created with different abilities... But what? We all will give the same accountability. Do you get that? So we've been given different abilities, but one day, because it says the king will come after a long time, or the master, it says, will return, and it says he will take an account. There will be a place of accountability, meaning this, an account given on your ability. So he will not ask us to give an account based on someone else's ability. Do you understand that? He will only, give you, only ask you to give an account based on your own ability and what God's entrusted to you. And when we understand that, it takes the pressure off. And so it's, this, it's been imparted. I love it, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, God gives to each according to his own will. Well, that's not fair. It's not what the scriptures say. God gives according to each, according to his will. So because some, he's given an ability for music. I was so blessed by Michael this morning, just worshiping. I was blessed even more by what he prayed in my office. Oh, God, let everything that we do just be filled with your presence. I am so grateful for God giving different abilities to different people so that when we do that and we operate in our own giftings and our own abilities, what happens is everyone is blessed, right? Everyone is encouraged. Everyone is built up. And it says he gives them according to God's will. It's not your will. It's not my will. Hear me. This might be a real shock, but we are not God. And if we try to be, we make a very poor, poor almighty. Because we take on responsibility that we're not called to. And so all we're called to do is encourage others with whatever ability that God has entrusted them. You just do it. Because one day, the scriptures will teach, the scriptures teach here that one day there's going to be an account that must be given. Well, you might say, well, I want, I want this ability. No, God's given you that ability and fine tune it. Whatever ability God's given to you, you own that and you say, I'm going to risk it. 
If God's given you the ability to be able to manage, then you manage with the ability he's given you. If God's given you the ability to encourage, encourage. I was so blessed with them. Our young men on Tuesday nights, Josh was talking to them, me about having them take a spiritual gifts test. And so Robin found it here around the office one day, and she brought it home last week. And so she took it one night at her, she took it one night at the house, and she says, you know what I'm not gifted in? I said, encouragement? No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, 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 did, I didn't answer. I'm going, I'm real wise. I didn't answer. I said, she said, I'm not gifted with evangelism. I said, okay. But, but I'm gifted I'm gifted with some administration things and stuff. I see, I see that. You see, it's the ability that God's given you, and you say it's according to his will. So these men, one was given five, and one was given two, and one was given one. Exactly what they needed for what they could use. And then it says this, that we will be judged on that level only. In Matthew chapter 16, it says, he will reward every man according to his work. Sometimes we get this idea that, that that's important to the kingdom and that's not important to the kingdom. I can tell you that if, if you run a business and you do it to the glory of God and to the honor of God, you're as, every, as, more, you're as important as anyone else in the kingdom. Or if you help with cleaning or cooking or whatever it is, you just do it to the glory of God, to the honor of God. And it says he will reward you because in the last part of this chapter, if you'll read it even later, maybe this afternoon, what it says is, you did it as unto me. When you were given out a cup of cold water, or you were visiting someone in prison, or you were just doing something that the world would classify as insignificant, insignificant or it doesn't really matter. See, that's based on our own definition, not on the kingdom definition. Because what Jesus says is you are doing it as unto me. And so whatever, whatever talent, whatever valuable resource that God has entrusted to you, you say it's for his glory, it's for his honor, and one day I will receive the reward because he's promised me. I liked what one guy said. He said some people, when they hear that God's going to give you a reward in heaven, you got a problem with that. Who do you think you are? To have a problem with God saying, I want to reward you. And you say, no, I don't think I deserve it. Right? When we get to heaven and he says, I'm going to give you a reward. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I love this scripture. And we'll put it up on the screen for us. It's verses 1 and 2. This is how one should regard us. As servants of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. That's how every one of us should be regarded, as stewards and servants. You know what a steward is? A steward is someone that just is responsible with what's been given to them that is not their own, but it's been entrusted to them. You and I are called to be stewards and servants of what God's entrusted to us and then live in a reverence to what's been given to us. So if you have the ability to run equipment, then you live with a reverence and saying, that's a God-given ability. That's a God-given gift that God's given me. Or you have an ability to care for people that are sick. Or you have an ability to teach people. That's a God, and you treat it with reverence. You say, that's what God's given me, and that's what God's entrusted to me. And I'm going to treat it with reverence. And I'm going to do it for his glory because I'm a steward of the Lord. I'm a servant of the Lord. And you honor that and then God's glory shows up. Have you ever watched The Chariots of Fire? It's a movie that was put out, now think of this, 40 years ago. Amazing. It came out in 1981. And it's a story of a Scottish-born runner. Really, he's not a runner, though a Scottish-born missionary. He died when he was just a little over 40-some years old, in his mid-40s. He died in a prisoner of war camp or an internment camp in China, the Japanese. But you think of his life. 
And so the whole story of the chariots of fire is this guy by the name of Eric Little. And his parents were missionaries to China. And so in this story, the, the whole premise of the story is that God had gifted him the ability to run. And so in 1926, he ran in the Olympics. And the reason people would have forgotten him a long time ago if he wouldn't have chosen to do one thing. But he would not run because it was a conviction that he had from God and he would not run on Sundays. And so the best race he could run, his, his best race was the 100 meter. But because it ran on Sunday, he said, no, I choose not to run. And I will run on Monday and I will run the 400 and the 200. In the 200, I believe he finished third. But in the 400 meter, he set a record. And he won a gold but here's what happened before that. Because there was a huge thing for him. It was a battle. Him to even go to the Olympics. I will love this quote, and so I'm going to put it up on the screen. Because he's telling his sister, and you can see in the movie, and it depicts this, that he's in this battle, and he's in this struggle. Should I go to China and be a missionary, or should I go to the Olympics and be a runner? And here's what he says. God made me for a purpose for China but he also made me fast. Don't you like that? He made me for a purpose for China, but did he just stop with China? Did he just stop with a heart to reach the 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 unchurched or the lost? But he said, he made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. To give that up would be to hold him in contempt. Oh. Oh. See, religion would say, oh, no. Feel condemned, feel condemned. When I run, I feel his pleasure. What do we do where God's given you that ability and you feel his pleasure in doing it and what happens is the enemy wants to come around and say, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't feel good about this. You shouldn't, you sh-. see, God wants you, because he's what? He's not only your master, he's your father and he wants you to enjoy the abilities and the giftings that he's given you. And so what did he do? He went out there and for the glory of God and what that whole movie's about is for the glory of God. It's for the glory of God. And so it's whatever he's given you that you enjoy it fully. It's like Jeffrey that can drive the ball. That's why I don't golf with Jeffrey. Because if I golf with Jeffrey, I have to go see Dr. Aki for my back issue. (laughs) But Jeffrey can drive the ball like a madman. He just, wham. So what does he do? He gets in these competitions. He won one up in Alaska, didn't you? And he just, and you know, he started feeling guilty about it. But what he told me about it at camp is he said, all of a sudden, the Lord said, no, I, I want you to enjoy this. I've given you this. We should enjoy what God's given us, shouldn't we? We shouldn't let the enemy rob us and steal from us. Amen. So these, these people, because the guy got five talents, he shouldn't see, oh, I don't deserve five talents. Or the guy that got two talents, oh, I wish I would have had five. Do you understand the, the principle here? Do you understand that it's not about, some people teach you that this is all about your money. And sometimes it can be related to money, but it's all so much more. Jesus wasn't given this illustration or this life lesson because he wants you to handle your, you need to handle your money right and you need to give and God bless you and all that. But it's so much more than that. It's embracing and enjoying the life that God's given you. Because when we do, all of a sudden we see the glory of God. Because not to would be contempt. Did you see that? Can think of that. Not to be would be contempt. A couple years ago, I was out in the back of my house, and I, I got this little um, tractor that I drive around, and in and, and back of my property, I just I create trails. I didn't have an de- idea why I was doing it, but now Jack's around, and so me and him, we go back there on trails, and I go with the meal, and he follows me with this little thing I found on the side of the road, and it's a little four-wheeler, and we put a Milwaukee battery in it. It's amazing how fast that thing will go. <laughs> And so now he follows me on these trails. I was back there a few years ago building these trails with this little tractor, and I was just grading dirt and digging dirt, and I was just having a great time because that's one of the abilities God's given me. Just to, and so I was enjoying it. And all of a sudden, I started driving toward the shed, and all of a sudden, I'm like, you should feel guilty about this. 
And I started feeling this weight of like, I could be out praying for somebody or out witnessing to somebody or out doing something. And all of a sudden, the Lord asked me this question. And, and what I mean by that is not audibly, but certainly in my mind, I heard this question. Would you be upset if you gave your something to your son and he enjoyed using it? Would you be upset about that? No. Would you be upset that God's given you something as an ability or something that you enjoy and then you should feel like you shouldn't enjoy it? What it, is that our Father in heaven? No, no, it's not our Father in heaven. But what he does is he says, I give you these things because I'm coming back one day to give an account so that you can give an account. So you understand that you've been given the responsibility and what you do with it is so vitally important. So these two took risk and they said, we're gonna live to live. We're gonna live not, not paralyzed by fear because there's one in the story that was paralyzed by fear, right? And he had all these judgments and not only did he have fear, but he had all these judgments and we're gonna look at them in a minute. But to the two, he says this to them. It was not based on their amount, but on their ability. In verses 21 and 23, it's the same, same exact uh, words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Because they were, their heart was good and they were close to God. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So he said... I've given you this now, and you've been faithful over that little thing. So he says, I'm going to entrust you with more. Some people have this idea that when you go to heaven, all you get is a harp and a good voice. <laughs> right? That's what some people think. <laughs> We're going to stand there and just play. <laughs> now, I got fingers that I, play, I could play harp because they're that tough. But I couldn't, do, I couldn't do it. I mean, it would sound horrible. You would be saying, I think I'm in hell. <laughs> no, not, not really. Not really. I shouldn't have said that. Because maybe we will have that ability when we get to heaven to have a good voice and stuff. But um, I hope I can sing like Leo right here. That's who I hope like. Um, but some people think that when you get to heaven, that's what you're going to be just sitting around playing the harp and singing. I don't think so. I know there's going to be worship in heaven, and I know that's going to be wonderful, but I believe this, that what you've been faithful with here in the little, God's going to entrust you with greater responsibility there. And I believe there's even scriptural, te there, of course there is, otherwise I wouldn't be teaching this, <laughs> but there's, <laughs> there's places where he says, I'm going to reward you. I'm going to take that faithfulness that you had over those five talents that were just temporary or earthly, and I'm going to give you more. Don't you think that we're getting prepared in heaven for, to be more than just, I, I believe that, and I believe that this is what Jesus is telling us. As he says, and then this isn't something that at the end of that statement, he says, enter into the joy of your master. Think of that. Enter into the joy of your master. Have you ever experienced where, where you've entrusted somebody with the responsibility and, and they just went and they just, wow. And you get the joy from it. Last Sunday night, Nick went to uh, the jail over here. And so on Monday morning, I said to him, Nick, how did it go? And he began to tell me, I think I had more joy about hearing what Nick had done at the time he had at the jail with all these guys. He said, just passed by and it was just like I was over and we had so much fun, but we were really... And I had so much joy from just hearing that. And then when I went to talk with Trevor this last week, he said, You've been, this church, your church has been such a blessing to this jail here. And he said, whatever we can do. And he said, we can accommodate that. We can put some stuff up because we're going to start streaming our services back there and we can't do it on Sunday mornings. But he says, we've got another night. If, they've got, if, you want, if there's people in this jail that want to... Why? Because there was a guy there and so it gives me great joy. Think of in heaven, when you've been faithful with a little, enter into the joy of your master. Where you just say, wow, Lord, for the glory of God. Where, where if we've experienced his giftings, we've experienced his abilities, and we've been faithful with that, and it brings joy to the master. When he sees you and I reacting and responding 
Just being responsible. And we might say it's small or insignificant, but it's not. He says it's giving him joy. But think of what it's going to be in heaven. The third servant, though, received one talent. And here's what he says. Think of this. He said, I knew you were a hard man. I was afraid. I went and hid your talent in the ground. Did you hear that three times? The other two servants never referred to I, I, I. We just did what we were supposed to do. This guy had a self-fixation on himself. I. I knew you were a hard man. I knew you planted where you didn't sow. All these things that were based, now were they correct assumptions? I don't believe they were. I don't believe they were correct assumptions. I believe that in that man's mind that he had made up these assumptions about who God is. How many make up wrong assumptions of who God is? And then all of a sudden we put that on him and it's not on him. It's really our, our, the way we view him. And there's something skewed in our perspective of who he is. I believe that, that when he was entrusted to this and all of a sudden he took this idea that I can't do this and what did he say? He says, I was afraid. And so I went and I did something out of fear. These other men did something out of faith. He did it out of fear. And what happens is the master calls him what? He calls him wicked. He calls him slothful. The word wicked is defined as this, being evil or morally wrong. There was something skewed about who the very, the very foundation of who he was. And it says he was slothful. The word sloth means this. It's a definition. is defined as a reluctance to work. And I love this second part. Or one who makes an effort to be lazy. Wow. Think of that. Makes an effort to be lazy. To make an effort to put obstacles in the way as to why he is not going to be responsible. Why he's not going to... And you know what he uses? is excuses. See, there's a separation that Jesus is telling us right here. That he says, when it all comes down, here's what's going to matter. Is you've been given an ability and there's going to be an account taken. And what do you and I do with what we've been given? Do we make up excuses? Well, if it would have been, you know, if I would have had a different background, if I would have had, there comes a place, and I know this, and hear me when I say this, I'm not, and I'm going to close, I'm not saying this with any irreverence, irreverence, but some of us have to let the past go. And whatever's happened to us that's been wrong, and we say, God, thank you for your forgiveness, thank you for your mercy, but I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am not going to let what happened to me when I was 12 or what happened to me when I was 22 define who I am today because I'm new in Christ. Because otherwise we just set ourselves up for excuses. And hear me, when I said that, in no way do I want you to feel condemned. I'm saying that what Jesus sees in you is one that has been given so much. Don't believe this lie about the enemy. Oh, he's made you wealthy. He's entrusted with you with things. And he wants you to rise up out of that place and step into this place of faith because he's going to hear one day, oh, I believe that you're here this morning because there's coming a day that you want to hear, oh, man, I wasn't perfect. Man, did I fall a few times. But I always remember his voice that says, oh, rise up, rise up. This isn't too big and it's not too hard and don't live in fear today. Oh, you're gonna be called the faithful one. You're gonna be the called the one that says, now enter in. The consequences of what we do right here matter. That's what I tell you, is what we do today matters. Because look at the result. Either reward or punishment. See, I read this and I think, oh, God, thank you that you've done so much for us. Thank you that you've given us so much. Help us to just keep reacting and responding with faith 
in these days that we're living in so we can hear well done. So we don't have to hear, man, I called you to step out. You let fear stop you. You just kept doing what God called you to do. You didn't look at the problem, you looked past the problem. And you started fixing things that need to be fixed. And you started living by faith where others would have said, it'd be easy just to be, just pull the covers in and pull it in. No, you just kept stepping out. You just kept believing. I'm so grateful for a church that's hungry for God. Hungry for his word today. Would you stand with me? just going to pray in a moment. Would you close your eyes right now? We're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to take whatever he's spoken to you. I believe there's something that's happened here this morning that is a, it's a word, it's a living word, it's a powerful word for you right now. Maybe you've been feeling guilty about things that God's entrusted to you and given you as a, abilities and you've been feeling guilty, but God's just setting you free from that. Maybe it's things that you've let the past define you and you've lived in fear because of some of the things. But today the Lord is calling you as faithful one. So Father, we thank you today for your word that God goes forth and it speaks to people. And, and we know that it's a miraculous thing because it's certainly not based in, in me or anything else, but it's based in you because you sent your word. You sent your word to set people free, like Nick said. You sent your word to heal people's hearts and minds. You sent your word, God, to give us hope for the future that's not based in what this world does or doesn't do. It's based in what you've already done. And so we bless you and we thank you, Jesus. And so right now, we ask you that you would take your word and it would ignite it into our lives and into our hearts and it would produce things in us this week that we would define as faithful. Because your word says if we would hear the word, that we would walk in it, that we would be those that would walk up and, and our faith would be strengthened and built up. And so I'm asking you for that right now. And we thank you, Jesus. And so we bless you, Lord. Thank you that no weapon formed against us can prosper because your word declares that it's not, it's void. You void out every plan of hell and that you enact every promise of God. And so God, you know everything that concerns us here this morning. Hmm. Here's the word of the Lord for you. There's some things that weigh on you and You don't have the ability to do anything about it. And the Lord is not calling you to be responsible for those things. He's just calling you to trust him in those things. And then there's other things that he says, no, I'm calling you to step into those because I've given you the ability. And so God, would you give people in this place the wisdom to know which of those they're supposed to, what they're supposed to do? With things they can't change, they're just gonna trust you to God move in that situation. And things that they can do, they'll sense God faith rising up in them and they will respond, God, encouraged to step into those places. And so we thank you for that, Jesus. How many receive that word? Yeah, amen, amen. Yeah. Well, if you need prayer this morning, come and we're gonna pray with you, pray for you. Otherwise, have a wonderful day. Enjoy the goodness of God and what he's done for us. If you need prayer, come and we'll pray.
unexplainable life.